Good morning. I'm so glad you could join us this morning for a discussion on how how we could be more at peace, how we could be more accepting, how we could be more um, in harmony with all that seems to be going wrong on the planet right now. And I'd like to start with a little reading that I posted earlier this week, and it seems to be so applicable. And it is the, the Wisdom of the Elders by a Hopi Elder. There is a river now flowing very fast. It is so great and swift. There are those who will be afraid. They will try to hold on to the shore. They will feel they're being torn apart and will suffer greatly. Know the river has its destination. The elders say we must let go of the shore, push off into the middle of the river, keep our eyes open and our heads above the water. And I say, see who is in there with you and celebrate. At this time in history, we are to take nothing personally, least of all ourselves. For the moment that we do, our spiritual growth and journey comes to a halt. The time of the lone wolf is over. Gather yourselves. Banish the word struggle from your attitude and your vocabulary. And all that we do now must be done in a sacred manner and in celebration. What I was thinking about before starting this uh, Facebook Live with you is the idea of faith. And what is faith? Faith, uh, to me, is a very strong belief, a conviction in a concept or an idea that cannot be proven. So faith is a conviction in a belief or an idea that cannot be proven. And I can assure you the only way that I can be at peace under any circumstance, particularly uh, these last few months when we're being faced with so many new ideas. The only way I can be at peace is to have accepted a number of faith-based positions which I've made my own, which I don't question, and which I live by. So what we would maybe begin with is to cover some of those. And the first one that comes to mind is that the faith-based position that never, 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 ever does anything go wrong. That's one. Another one is, if I want to be at peace, if I want to be truly at peace, it is an inside job. I simply cannot continue to think that if only something outside of me changed, if only the coronavirus uh, as somebody said quite recently, as a miracle disappeared. If only the economy could be kick-started again. If only I could go out for dinner. If only, if only. And all these if onlys come back to me as a defeat, as a, as a losing proposition, because you may have noticed, no matter how many wishes, no matter how many times I say if only, Nothing seems to be changing. And in, my, in the past, before this uh, amazing, uh, highly unusual situation we all find ourselves in, if something did change out of sight, outside of myself, I did feel good for a while. And I'm sure you all had that experience. There were a few minutes, there were a few days, there were a few months perhaps that I felt better. And then, slowly, I go back to where I always thought I was. And what the corona crisis, if we can call it that, <clears throat> is offering me more than anything else is to recognize that nothing outside of me needs to change. It's to recognize that my entire experience of this particular time in history comes from my thoughts, comes from my beliefs. So if I want to have a different experience on the planet today and any other day, years after the corona has become a distant memory, 
it's still the truth. Correction does not belong at the symptom level where it will not work. The symptom level is the, the shutdown, the being locked in, the being not being able to go out, the not being able to go work, back to work. Those are the symptom levels. And that brings hardship. There's no question. There's no question that millions of us are experiencing severe, severe hardship at the form level. But correction at the form level will not work. So where do we go? Where do we go with this? Well, we learn to treat this time as if any other time, any other upset. What does that require? That requires, as I said, faith, but it also requires discipline. It also requires discipline. And the discipline is to continuously go back. So no, this is about me. So the step, the, the process we're going to use, and there are a lot of you <clears throat> that have joined us today that are not familiar with the work. So I want to run very quickly through the process that we'll be using later together. And that process we call uh, lovingly call the six step process to freedom. And it starts with acknowledging that I'm upset. That's not difficult to do these days. There's millions of us upset, if not billions. Step two is the most challenging and particularly today. Because step two says this is about me. This is not about Corona. This is not about being locked in. This is not about uh, my grandfather or grandmother just passing. This is not about I have, having lost my job. Those are the symptoms. So if I'm willing to say step two, and if ever there was a faith-based position, that's probably it. Step two says, this is all about me. Nothing outside of me needs to change. This is all about me. Wow, that's huge. If I'm willing to take that step, then I move on to the next one. And I ask myself, what am I feeling? I'm not at peace. That was step one. Step two is it's about me. Step three, what am I really feeling? And I can't tell you how many emails, how many messages we receive daily of people that are feeling crippling anxiety, numbing worry. Some of you are expressing huge rage at how could this have happened? Who allowed this to happen? Who can we point at? Who can we cause? Who can we say you are at fault here? The feelings that I have, the strongest feeling that I have, I have to look at with love, I have to recognize I have chosen that feeling. And again, there's many of you unfamiliar with our work. And so what I just threw in is another face based position. And that is I choose the feelings I experience. I choose the feelings I experience. Nobody and nothing can make me feel anything. So when I say, well, everybody would feel this way. Well, in this case, you're probably right. There's probably several billion people that are in anxiety right now. And the problem with that awareness, the problem of knowing these facts and these numbers, these global numbers of upset, is that it gives the ego ammunition and say, see, everybody feels this way. Everybody is anxious. Everybody is in fear. Therefore, it must be real. And your job and my job is to say, no, it doesn't matter how many people agree. I can only go back to the truth within. And if I don't go back to the truth within, then I keep looking at the form that my beliefs have taken. Then I will think it's the form. And all I have to do is change the form. <clears throat> all we have to do is find a cure. All we have to do is find that um, the magic bullet that ends it all. And then I'll be okay. And you will be okay. But in doing so, what I've done, I've forgotten to recognize that what I'm feeling right now is actually familiar. This anxiety, this fear is actually familiar. And at the deep level, it is actually chronic. 
It is not a stretch to recognize that the whole world chronically lives in fear. Look at the arms race. Look at the huge number of wars and skirmishes and conflicts all around the planet. All around the planet. It is no better now than it was 100 years ago or 500 years ago or at any time in history. It's the same. The same fear pervades mankind century after century. And to grab this time and say, see, we have a reason. We have a reason to be afraid. This is terrifying. People are dying. That's true. That is true. People are dying. And people are dying in larger numbers than is normal. And families under circumstances that are immensely challenging. <clears throat> I've heard, <clears throat> excuse me, I've heard from people who are stuck at home. One person wrote me a couple of days ago saying, uh, I've lived with this, this man um, who is her husband for some 20 odd years. What's become more and more clear to me, I don't want to be with him. I find them overbearing, I find them bullying, I find them unpleasant. And yet we've lived together for 20 years. What happened? Well, what happened is I can't go out anymore. I'm now at home with this person. I have nowhere to go. I am now faced with this person day in, day out. And here's the good news. I'm not faced with this person. I'm faced with who I think I am. That is what this person brings up in me. So after a few minutes, we'll go into a full process and help everybody process that particular issue. I am sure there are many, many, many people that are at home in relationships that are incredibly challenging, where all the little points that you hate about each other, <clears throat> that you were able to hide conveniently behind work, behind parties, behind fun, behind travel, behind money, behind new cars, behind new houses, behind interesting babies. Now you can't hide anymore. Now you're faced with who you are. Now you're faced with who you think you are. Because who you think you are is reflected by the person that is sitting in front of you. Let's do a few questions. Stacy, do you have a question? <clears throat> okay, from Carol. Uh, Dietrich, I'd like to hear your perspective on dealing with feelings of deprivation and loss and missing out during this time of stay at home, government orders. I've had this issue come up in many ways in my weekly Choose Again circle. Obviously, we use the six steps to uncover the false beliefs that are driving it. However, when birthdays and events and special occasions like holidays and graduations and so on are not able to be held. And there's great collective collusion around the deprivation and the trigger just keeps coming up. Just keep processing. What else is there to do? Any thoughts? Carol, what a wonderful question and great to hear from you and see you, uh, however, virtually. Um, I'm dealing with feelings of deprivation and loss. I wrote a little piece about that a couple of days ago, and it's how interesting it is that we are, that we even use the word loss. There's a little joke that it, uh, to lose one parent is sad, to lose two is careless. In other words, loss, loss, loss. If I go back to one of my favorite faith-based positions, and that is oneness, that we are one, that actually everything I see is within me. The entire universe is within me. How is loss possible then? So the forgiveness that we would do in this particular case of deprivation and loss is forgive me for believing that I can lose anything. I cannot lose anything. Both my parents died, oh God, 40 years ago, I think, something like that. I didn't lose my parents. The people I called my parents are no longer here, absolutely. But who they are, the essence of the parents, the essence of others that I've lost over the years, remains because that essence is within me. That essence is you. That essence is all of us. 
So deprivation, loss, um, and all the other wonderful feelings that so many of you feel right now come from the belief that I'm separate and that I'm alone and that whatever I don't have in my mind, because it's a mistaken belief, but whatever I believe I don't have, I have to get from the outside. And right now I can't get anything from the outside. I'm not allowed to go outside. Right now I'm forced to look within and say, my God, this is all within me. Or I can bang my head against the wall and hate the world and be furious that this is happening and blame God knows who. But we'll find somebody we can blame. It's somebody's fault, no question. Because that's how the ego works. If I have an unpleasant experience, I have two choices. I can blame myself or I can blame you. Well, it's much more convenient and much more attractive for me to blame you than to blame the self. But if I go back to the faith-based position that I mentioned right in the beginning, nothing has ever gone wrong. Nothing has ever gone wrong. Then who is that to be blamed? There is no blame. Then there's only the wonderful, immensely powerful question that we've trained our minds to ask that I would encourage you to learn to ask. And that is, what is this for? What is this for? Millions of people are at home. Millions of people are sick. Hundreds of thousands of people are dying. What is this for? That is a powerfully radically question. Are you willing to ask that question? And are you then willing to answer it? Because it can only be for me. It can only be for me to look, uh, <clears throat> Carol, at my experience of deprivation and loss. What is that for? That's for me to do the correction. There can't be anything missing. I am whole and complete. We are whole and complete. We are all there is. There's only oneness. And you ask, this keeps coming up, this keeps coming up. Yes, it keeps coming up for every one of us <clears throat> because it isn't healed yet. The belief in lack has not been healed yet. And lack is the belief that there is a state somehow different from the one I'm in that I would be better off in. Lack is the belief that there is a state somehow different from the one I'm in that I would be better off in. And you can see that that is a belief and a, and a way of thinking that the entire world uses all the time. If I only get a raise, if I only get a job, if I only have another partner, if something outside of me changed, then I would be happy. It's the belief that there's a state somehow different from the one I'm in. Faith-based position says, no, I'm exactly where I need to be. I'm, I'm experiencing exactly what I need to experience. What is that for? That is for me to look once again at the fact that even though I have done this work for 25 years or so, I still have beliefs. I still have a belief. I, my strongest belief is still I can lose love. Now, I can lose love, fortunately, is not a belief that's triggered in the current circumstances, but it is triggered in relationship. It is triggered in all my relationships uh, within Choose Again, within the organization, in my personal relationship at home with Stacy, it comes up from time to time. And then I don't say, oh, I wish it didn't come up anymore. I'm grateful that it comes up because it simply says, here is one reason you are not completely at peace at all times yet. And that reason is you still believe you can lose love. So Carol, you still have a belief that there's lack within. You still have a belief that if only fill in the blank, don't attack yourself for that, and I know you won't because you're a very, very experienced practitioner. Look at that lovingly and say, thank God that is not true. There's nothing lacking. There's nothing that I need. There's nothing that's missing right now. There's nothing that needs to change for me to be at peace. Does that answer your question? And later we'll process that in a more formal setting. Stace, do you have another question? Mm -hmm. In a state of love, is the state of love knowing who I am, who the other is, is the state of love knowing about oneness. Though I am familiar and working with ACIM, choose again, the power of now, etc., I'm still overpowered by the agony in the situation with Corona. 
I even experience panic attacks. How can I get out of that state of mind when that happens? Okay, well, maybe, maybe it's time that we do a process together. I have no idea how many people are in line right now, and it doesn't matter. If there was one, it'd be the same process if there's a thousand. <clears throat> so I have no idea how many of you are here. But let's do a process together. Let's really become present and feel this anxiety. Anxiety is the most feeling I keep hearing about. And anxiety is just a form of fear, of course, we know that. So if we all close our eyes and do this process, and that goes, somebody just put some, something in front of my face on the screen. Um, step one, I'm upset. Notice that when you say step one, I'm upset, you not say I'm upset because. Because when I say I'm decided that I know why I'm upset and that something that upsets me has to change or be removed or whatever. So step one is simply, I'm upset. Say that for a minute. I'm upset. And the reason you're on today with me and today with us with Choose Again is because you're upset. Step two, <clears throat> as I said earlier, is the most difficult, the most radical, and the most essential. Step two says, this is about me. Crazy. Are you crazy, says the ego. Look what's happening outside of you. We haven't been outside. My favorite thing is I am that sushi. Now, that is a first world problem. It's terrible what's happening. Millions of people are losing their jobs. Millions of people are absolutely desperate to get through the day. And yet, you're saying this is about me? Take that step. Have faith. Have faith. It is a faith-based step. This is about me. And that step is only palatable if I also accept the fact that nothing has gone wrong. Because as long as I think that something is going wrong and I say it's about me, then it's a guilt trip. And boy, I'm good at guilt trips. I can lay them on you, I can lay them on me, and they're flawless. I'm really good at it. Not in this time. This is not the time for guilt trips. It's about me as a joyful, a joyful responsibility, because that means I can do something about it. Step two, it's about me. Step three, what am I really feeling? And let's just work with the feeling of anxiety, because that seems to be the universal feeling. So close your eyes and feel that feeling of anxiety. Make it as big as you can. Sit with it for a minute. I remember having anxiety in the pit of my stomach that felt like hot tar. Feel it. Take a deep breath. Take it in. Take in that anxiety. Let it fill your whole being. And then ask yourself, is it a familiar feeling? And the answer is, of course it is. Of course it is. There are no new feelings and corona or no corona. I don't make new feelings. So the feeling of anxiety is familiar. You know why that's so important? Because that takes you out of the idea that you know why you're upset. That takes you out of step one saying, I'm upset because. Because it is a familiar feeling, you also know now, immediately, that it actually has been triggered in you under many different circumstances. You feel this before. Now keep your eye closed and ask yourself to have this feeling of anxiety take you back to an early memory. Something happened. Something happened when you were little or in your early memory. It doesn't have to be little, an early memory. And allow yourself to bring up that memory. And what is that memory? What is that memory? Once you find it, you also know what the genesis is of this feeling. Where did it start? In your memory right now, it started in that memory. In truth, of course, it happened long, long before that. But we're not going that far today. We don't need to. We're working with something very practical. 
So the feeling of anxiety is familiar. You found when you first felt it. I remember when I first felt it. I was at home in Indonesia with my little brother. My older brother had been sent to Holland and my parents were going to go out to visit some friends and they were at least two hours late. I had no idea where they were. I had no idea why they were not back. And I felt overwhelming anxiety. What did that anxiety say about me? Because it was all feelings. And this is the important message about feelings. All feelings simply say something about me. Not about the circumstance. All feelings give me a message about me. How do I know that? Because they're chosen by my beliefs about me. So the feeling of anxiety that you and I, and so many of us feel right now, was chosen by an I that I made up. And what is that belief that chooses this feeling of anxiety? Well, for me it was, I'm alone. I'm not loved. I'm not safe. Nobody's taking care of me. That was the message. And maybe some of you resonate with that. Maybe some of you have many other reactions to the feeling of anxiety, many other interpretations of what it could mean to you about you. So what would it say to, about me that I'm not safe? What would it say about me that I'm not taken care of? And that means that I'm not loved. One of my beliefs is that I'm not loved. Is that true? Now we go to the faith-based position that that could not be true because I am love. The essence of my being is love. The essence of your being is love. And in the essence is where we are. In the essence is where the oneness is manifested. And in that essence, there are no feelings other than unspeakable joy. So then we do the forgiveness. And that says very simply in this case, and in your case, maybe something else, maybe another belief came up. But in this case that I'm using, forgive me for believing I'm not loved. I'm not loved. And the answer that I give myself, because it's an inside job, no one needs to say that or see it or know it. That is not true. I made that up. That is bullshit. I am love. Not the I that I call Diederik. Not the I that walks around the planet. That I is not love. That I is an invention. But the essence of that I is unchangeable. And the essence is in that I that I believe is so unlovable. It's always there. It just waits for me to do my forgiveness, to clear a tiny bit of the huge barrier to love that I created so many years ago, almost 78 years ago. Forgive me for believing I'm not lovable. That is not true. I made that up. Then the last step of the six step process is one where we do the positive correction of Forgive me for forgetting that the truth of me is love. Forgive me for forgetting that nothing outside of me ever needs to change. Forgive me for forgetting that I am divinely supported. Maybe I don't feel supported by the government. Maybe I don't feel supported by my boss who just cut my wages in half. Maybe I don't feel supported by other what I call betrayals. But they have nothing to do with who I am. I'm divinely supported. So my belief that I can lose love is beautifully corrected in this process. The ego can lose love because it doesn't even know what it is. So it loses it all the time. That's why we lose parents. That's why we lose dogs. That's why we lose entire sections of population. That's why so many of us are threatened all the time because that's the ego. The ego is the belief in separation and is always under threat. But that's not who you are. That's not who I am. And that's not who collectively we are. Collectively, we are one 
love. Mm-hmm. And honest to, I don't want to say, but honestly, I cannot imagine a way out of this if I stayed in duality. If I thought there was a you and an I, if I thought there was uh, an organization that could either help me or cannot help me, if I thought that something outside of me could affect me positively or negatively, I would never and could never be at peace because I would never trust it. Why not? Because that duality would be within me. And so I would see the self that I hate attack the self that I love. If that were possible, it's not possible, but in my mind it is. And so I'd be always be under attack. There's a great line in A Course of Miracles, and it says, the secret of salvation is but this. You are doing this to yourself. No matter who takes the role of attacker or what the form of the attack is, still is this the truth. I'm doing this to myself. This anxiety, this anxiety is generated within me. Even though the ego screams, just listen to the news, just watch any newspaper, blah, blah, blah. It's all out there. Yes, it is. But I'm seeing it out there. I am seeing it out there. And what am I suffering from is my interpretation of what I'm seeing. I do have one power, and that's the power of interpretation. I see this differently. I can choose to see this entire time in history differently. And that doesn't mean that I can list, as has been done so many times recently, I can list all the positive things that are coming out of there, out of the corona crisis. That's still the same thing. It doesn't matter what comes out of the corona crisis. What comes out of the corona crisis only has meaning within. The fact that I can now hear the birds, that I can breathe easier, that the less cars on the road, that's all wonderful. But that's not why I'm going to be joyful. I'm going to be equally joyful when I cannot hear the birds anymore, when the roads are clogged with cars again, when the pollution picks up again, which it will. That's key to my work. My joy, my happiness does not depend on anything outside of me. What an incredible gift to have the whole planet immersed, immersed in what you would easily call a crisis. And yet for the whole planet to finally turn it around and say, that crisis is within me. Nothing outside of me needs to change. It will change. There's no question. It will change perhaps for the good in the ego sense. It will change perhaps that we finally realize that multinationals cannot be our government, et cetera, et cetera, you name it, but it will change. But the change has to be within. It's not, it's changing symptoms. There's a funny little saying, it's like changing the deck chairs, rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic. Stace has, has another question we're going to look at. Okay, this is from uh, Tarek Albert. Mm-hmm. While I'm absolutely taking all of this seriously at this time, I sometimes feel guilty that I don't portray the fear that seems expected. Where does this come from and how do I let go of the guilt? Brilliant question. I could, I'm not sure if you could hear. This is from uh, a gentleman named Tarek and he asked, um, what was I'm basically feeling guilty for not feeling guilty. Ah, is that a familiar thought? I'm feeling guilty for not feeling guilty. My God, how often does that come up? Uh, And that is because we have, society tells us what we should be feeling. So society tells me I should be joyful and something goes well. My party wins an election, I should be joyful. My team wins the world championship. Hasn't happened yet, but good. Uh, I should feel joyful. My team loses the World Cup. I should feel sad. Take it back. It's got nothing to do with outside of me. So if I don't feel guilty when I see other people being miserable, it is simply because I've learned to see the truth. That's why. I've learned to see and know and integrate at my deepest level that I know that nothing is going wrong. I'm not listening to the screaming and the Uh, incredible agony that's being expressed by millions of people. I hear it, 
but I refuse to believe it. I refuse to go along with it. I will not make you wrong for having anxiety. I'm having fear. I'm feeling miserable. That is your choice. But I will give you another way of looking at it. Is there another way? Is there another way of seeing this? I'm not guilty. Forgive me for believing I'm guilty. So if I'm feeling guilty right now for not feeling guilty, it's because I already feel guilty all the time. That's the beauty of this time. All the feelings that I feel all the time are accentuated, uh, uh, what do you call that, amplified, blown up in my face. So it becomes more and more true in my mind that this is what's happening. No, it's not. It's just being amplified, that's all. So Tarek, if you feel guilty right now about not feeling guilty, go back to that guilt. Because that guilt has nothing to do with this or anything else. That guilt is, comes from an old belief you hold an old belief that you've done something wrong. Now, guess what? There's seven point something billion on the planet, people, and seven point something billion on the planet has that same deeply held belief at some level, I have done something wrong. How do I know I've done something wrong? Because I'm not not in paradise, I'm not in heaven, I'm not with God, says the ego. I must have done something wrong, I'm separate. And again, it's reversing cause and effect. I'm separate because I think I'm separate. It's my thoughts alone that cause me pain. I cannot be separate. I can believe it. I can think it. I can act as if it's true. I can feel shitty. I can feel guilt. But I cannot make it true. I'm not separate. So forgive me for believing I'm separate. Forgive me for believing, Tarek, that I've done something wrong. Now, I know your ego comes up with, oh, yeah. You forgot what you've done wrong? Here, let me give you the list. It's a long list of things you and I have done wrong. It's a long list of things that we think are terrible. And you can look at each one of those. And you can say each one of those was a cry for love. Each one of those that I've done, each one of those terrible things that I've done, thought or said, came from a belief that I'm not lovable. Came from a belief that there's something wrong with me came from a belief that there's something lacking. I'm guilty. Thank God that is not true. You're unchangeably innocent. And whether you feel what other people feel or not is irrelevant. Many, many years ago, about 25 years ago, we had a youth camp um, in the old days of Youth and Purpose. And the, the motto of that youth camp was, I am exclusively concerned with my own mind. This is a time to practice that. Don't worry about what other people feel. Notice it, feel empathy, but true empathy. Recognize they're in pain. And recognize you don't have to be. Don't concern yourself with what other people are feeling. They're, whatever they're feeling is what they're choosing to feel. If they come to you and they come to me and they ask, how can I get out of this feeling? Then we have an answer that works. Other than that, it's not your business. Let it go. You're innocent. You haven't changed. I hope that helps you a little bit. Next question, please. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Diedrich. I have two related questions. How do I deal with deeply buried feelings of guilt and fear for which I cannot find roots in my own childhood? Can feelings like guilt and fear be passed on by parents or somehow genetically? Well, uh, that's a really good question. So some people, when we start doing this work together, they say, well, I can't feel that far back. I can't feel the feeling of guilt and shame. But but when I are they familiar, they say, oh, yeah, they're familiar. If they're familiar, it means they have their root in the first eight years of your life. That's a fact. I mean, a lot of what we teach and a lot of what we used to teach uh, a long time ago when, when nobody else was teaching it yet, is radical, but that is now being absolutely established um, without question. Whatever I'm feeling now is a repeat of something else in the first eight years of my life. What chose that feeling in the first years of my life is an identity I made up in the first years of my life. So you don't have to worry about being able to go back. Eventually you will. Eventually my experience is to do this work, 
the further back my memories go. And the further back they go, I get closer and closer and closer to the moment when time of terror took the place of love. That's a line from A Course in Miracles. When the time of terror took a place of love. And that could be something really painful. Like I'm lying in my crib, I'm, I'm looking at the wonderful mobiles above my head, and my father comes home and the door is out of shock. That's the time of terror. Immediately, I make up a belief. If I was lovable, if I was important, my father would not have to do it. I'm like that. Whether he slammed it on purpose, which is what my ego is going to say anyway, or whether the wind took it, doesn't matter to me. It was an assault. And it was a direct message, according to my ego, that says, you're not loved, you're not important, you don't matter. And I believed it at that moment. Now I have to undo that belief. It's true. You know what it meant that my father slammed the door? It meant my father slammed the door. That's all it meant. And I hope that answers your question. There was also something about safe. Um, I'm not safe. I'm not safe. If one is just the truth and the loss and nothing outside of me needs to change, then I am absolutely safe. Brent Haskell, uh, who wrote an absolutely magnificent book, Journey Beyond Words, repeats that book very many times. I am absolutely safe. I am absolutely loved. What does the word absolute mean? Unconditionally. I don't have to do anything for it. I don't have to build a fortress. I don't have to build the largest weaponry this planet has ever seen in one country. I'm absolutely safe and absolutely loved. And that is within. And that's what this time brings up so powerfully that I finally can go back to that. I hope that answers your question. Next one. Uh, for those of us familiar with this process, what are some simple ways to communicate with family, friends, and neighbors who reach out to me that I want to support, but who are caught up in the stories of fear? They don't have the lexicon, lexicon of this work, so I find it challenging to find the words to plant the seeds with them. That is a really good question, because that's a question that doesn't just necessarily have to do with what's happening right now. It has to do with um, recognizing how do I feel when other people are upset? How do I feel when I watch scenes of devastations of uh, refrigerated trucks in New York, uh, when I see um, families who've lost one? How do I feel? That is where my work is. And what I've done, my processing around that, that which is always guilt, always guilt, it's my fault somehow. Can you imagine how insane that is? It's my fault that these refrigerated trucks in New York are compiled full of dead bodies. That is my fault somehow. And even though that sounds insane, don't underestimate the power of it within your own mind. Because that part of the oneness, the ego, has not been able to escape. So it sees everything as one, but it's all your fault. And that's a very different position. Cool? I feel guilt and, over, and an overwhelming sense of responsibility for my seven-year-old twin boys. I feel like I'm not providing enough structure for them. The structure you want to provide is within you. It's absolutely always just within you. Do not worry about your twin year old, uh, seven-year-old twins. Your seven-year-old twins are watching you. And if you, and I'm not, not meaning that as an attack or an accusation or as blame at all, but if you are constantly in worry and constantly in anxiety, your twins get the message of something very wrong right now. And if my mother can't handle it, what the hell am I going to do about that? So the thing you do for your children is to recognize that they will look at you and they will see your beliefs. Beliefs run in the family. Nothing to do with genes or DNA. Beliefs run in the family. So if I have a belief that I'm weak and powerless and that I'm a victim, 
Guess what? Kids will pick that up. Not only that, will be their fault that you're a victim. In their minds, they have victimized you. In their minds, they're responsible for how you feel. So when you look at your kids and you feel guilty about how they are and how they might be feeling or how they might be experiencing this whole episode, they will pick up on that. The best thing you can do with your children is to know who you are, to talk about your feelings. This is what I'm feeling right now in these circumstances. You know what? But I'm making those feelings up. They come from me. Wow, the message you give your kids is staggering. What you're teaching them right now, they don't have to feel this. They can feel anything they choose to feel, but you're showing them, you're teaching them how to return to love, how to actually know who you are. That's huge. That's very powerful. Anne Andrew, who is one of my favorite people on the planet, wrote an incredible book. And it says, why they, what they don't teach you in prenatal class, the key to raising trouble-free kids. So for all of you who are online right now and who have children at home and who are being challenged, who are actually learning that your five-year-old is not as adorable as you always thought he was when you dropped him off at preschool and didn't see him for another five hours. Now you see him all day long. He's not that adorable. Your four-year-old daughter is not that cute. Much to say, do they? They're just little people. But to go back to learning that you are love and therefore you can see them as nothing but love is huge. Anne's book will help you with that in a beautiful, beautiful, lovingly guided way. It is based on the six-step process, but in a direct application to family at home. And this might be the time you need that book more than ever. So I hope you pick it up and I hope you practice it. Uh, let's do one more. Let's do one more question. Hang on a minute, I saw. No, I think I've handled the big mm -hmm. questions. What I'm, what I'm seeing in all the comments is that people are really taking it in and are really uh, recognizing that there's something here that is truthful and that they can use. And that's my biggest wish for you. Mm -hmm. So if you can go back and click on that link, click on the like, uh, for some reason there's a word called al algorithms and I don't know what that means, but I've been told that algorithms are important, uh, even though they're well outside of it, I'm still supposed to give them some meaning. So please click the lick, like button and please click on the link so you can receive the bonus material we're sending you as soon as that's clicked on. The bonus material will be uh, a number of things. So it will be a worksheet, uh, which you can use to do your process at home deliberately and very aware with great awareness. It will also include a six uh, page or nine page little booklet on the six step process. If you want more information, of course, uh, there's my book called uh, Choose Again, The Six-Step Process, which is available in many different outlets. You can also join online circles. Choose Again offers a range of online circles, particularly in this time, to help as many people as possible to get through this crisis. And you can also sign up for our um, daily messages. And eventually, when the doors are open again, Come join us in Costa Rica. Come join us at a workshop. Come join us in France. This work is about is to return to unspeakable joy. I want to end with reading uh, a little Rumi that I actually uh, put in the, the very first page of my book. I wish I could show you when you're lonely or in the darkness, the astonishing light of your own being. Thank you very much for joining us. And I look forward to hearing from you and I look forward to joining with you again in the future. Thank you so much.